Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I'm doing a series called Beauty for Ashes. I wrote the book 19 years ago, but the thing that's interesting to me is the word of God never gets old. I've taught this series publicly probably two or three times over those years. It's been about eight years since I've taught it. And I wanted to do it again, and it was evidenced last night just by the reaction that I got when in teaching this that many people did not have an understanding that God is interested in healing your wounded emotions. We have to get over thinking that the only thing that God wants to do is keep us out of hell. He wants us to have a great life. And if your emotions are all messed up, if you have a lot of addictive behaviors because of wounds in your past, then you're not going to enjoy your life. And the, the other thing that is so important is very few other people are going to be impressed with your relationship with God enough to want one themselves. We need to be stable, mature, healed, whole individuals. Let me say it again. Stable, <laughs> mature, healed, whole, vibrant individuals. And if we're living the life that Jesus died for us to have, truth is, we will not have to try to beat everybody over the head with our Bible. They're going to actually be wanting to know something's different about you. What? How can you be so happy? Wait. You mean you went through that as a child and now you're, how, how can that be? And that's what we need. That's our greatest witness is a healed and a complete life. So, as you know, well, maybe you don't know, there might be a few that don't know, maybe some people that just turned on the television set for the first time today. I was sexually abused by my father for somewhere around 15 years, I think. Repeatedly, regularly, And it damaged my personality. Your personality is a, is a combination of your God-given temperament and the things that happen to you, usually in the early years of your life, but it doesn't always have to be those early years of your life. But much of our personality is formed in the first few years of our life. People need love. God has created us for acceptance, not rejection. He has created us for connection, not separation and abandonment. There is a, a God need in us, a need placed in us by God to have love, unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. When people don't get that, or when they're used for a purpose other than what they should be used for, a lot of bad things begin to happen. Most of us go through hurts in our life, and then all of a sudden we're adults, and we've got all these layers of mess in our soul, and we try to find some way to function in society through pretending or wearing masks or just hiding from things. The truth be told, many, many people are miserable behind their frozen smile, and they're really failing at relationships. We have to know who we are in Christ, otherwise what we end up doing is we put a tremendous burden on everybody that we're in relationship with to make us feel good about ourselves. Now, I want you to hear this. If you don't love yourself, and if you don't know that God loves you, And when I say love yourself, I'm not talking about being selfish and self-centered. I'm talking about you get along with yourself. You're not always in a constant war about you. Well, I'm not this. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Well, we're all not something, but we are something too. We need to learn to look at the more positive side of it. But if you don't have that confirmation in you that you're loved and that you're okay, you may not be perfect, but you're okay, you're growing, you're on your way then you're always going to look to other people to make you feel good about yourself. And nothing destroys a relationship faster than that because the other person feels manipulated and controlled and pressured all the time 
to keep that insecure person propped up. And I'm gonna take you through a, a trickle-down theory of what happens if you know that God loves you, but you think he loves you based on conditions that you must fulfill, and all the mess that causes in your life. And then I'm gonna take you through what happens if you know that God loves you unconditionally. If that's the root and the foundation of who you are, I know that God loves me unconditionally and how that changes every single thing after that. Today is gonna to be a little bit clinical. It's gonna be like you have gone to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and you walked in and said, I am really messed up. <laughs> and some of you might think, well, that's not for me because I've got it all together. Well, okay, I'm happy for you. <laughs> but let me tell you, even if you do, you probably are around some people that are messed up and so we'll just say by some stretch of the imagination that you've got it all together. You still need to understand those other messed up people in the world. I could probably say when Dave and I got married that I was pretty messed up and he was pretty together. Dave had a great foundation in the word of God. His dad was an alcoholic and actually died from drinking. So he really didn't have a present father in the home, but his mom was a godly woman who made sure they went to church and taught them the principles of God and lived those principles out in front of him. And so that's encouragement for those of you who maybe there's only one parent who seems to have any brains in the home. You can overcome the bad effect that somebody else is having through prayer and through being a great witness and an example and through teaching your children the Word of God. The Word of God will always prevail over messes if it's taught properly and lived out in the home. Come on now. So you don't have to live in fear and think, well, you know, my kids are gonna be a mess because he or because she or whatever. You just keep doing what's right and trust God that there's power in His Word and in His principles to overcome whatever the mess might be. But Dave had a great experience with God at an early age. He was born again when he was a young boy. Received the fullness of the Holy Spirit in his life when he was about 18 and really studied the Word. And so he came into our relationship ready for me. <laughs> you, you may have heard me tell this, but, you know, Dave and I only had five dates and got married. I don't probably recommend that, but... Um, the first night he saw me, I was washing my mother's car and he tried to flirt with me, which I didn't like men, didn't trust men and had a very snotty, sarcastic attitude. And uh, the reason why I didn't like him was because I'd been hurt by every man that I ever got around, used and abused and, and hurt, taken advantage of. And so when he said, hey, hey. <laughs> if you remember back in the days, I had this big beehive, you know. Had on my little short shorts and I was out there washing the car. And, hey, when you get finished washing that car, do you want to wash mine? I turned around and I said, if you want your car washed, wash it yourself. <laughs> and he said, I'm telling you the absolute truth. He said, the thing that went off in my heart was that's the girl for me. So he either really wanted a big challenge, wasn't too smart, or was being led by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so we had five dates and he asked me to marry him and I always like to say it's probably a good thing he did because if he would have hung around me too long, he would have gotten afraid because I really just was messed up. My personality was all messed up. But in Isaiah chapter 61, as I began to study the Word of God diligently, and that didn't happen for many years because I was in a large religious denomination that had a great foundation about salvation, but I never, I never learned much about how to live my daily life or how to, well, I did learn some things about how to live my daily life, but not much about how to overcome my past. And uh, when I became a real student of the Word of God, and you know, there's a big difference in going to church on Sunday and studying the Word of God. How many of you know that there's a big difference in that? 
There's a big difference in you turning on my TV program every day and hearing that and you studying the Word of God. So I'll just tell you, and as much as I want you to watch my program, if you don't have time for me and God, then put Him first. <laughs> Amen? Because there's nothing that is more valuable to you than your personal time with God. I think it's good to watch somebody like me get that word, take some notes, and then look those scriptures up, study it for yourself, take some time at lunch or whatever, and meditate on what you've learned. Don't just wait for somebody else to download everything into you. Be a serious student of the word of God. Well, when I began to really study the Word, I started finding out how really messed up I was. The Bible says that the Word is like a mirror. And you look into it, and you know, you can have dirt on your face and not know it at all, but if you go look in a the mirror, then you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've been, you know, walking around with that all day. Well, see, the Word of God is so valuable because we look in it like a mirror, and through that, we, we begin to see the promises of God, but we also begin to see not only what's available to us, but what's wrong with us, and that's healthy. Because you can never get to where you need to be if you don't face where you're at. Somebody please listen to me today. Stop blaming everything on somebody else and ask God to show you, you. Amen? We get so fixated on what everybody else is doing wrong. Well, you're doing this and you're doing that. You can't change them. You cannot change other people. Only God can change other people. But what you can do is let God do what he wants to do and you pray for them and you can see a lot of change in your life, a lot of good change. Well, one of the things that I had was a lot of addictive behaviors. And you say, well, what's an addictive behavior? Well, it's a habit that's gone wild. It's like... Um, it's something that you can't do without. Now, I wasn't addicted to drugs. I wasn't addicted to alcohol. But I had other personality addictions. I had to control everything or I couldn't be happy. I'm sure none of you have that problem. <laughs> I'm sure everybody here is just sweet and submissive and you don't have a rebellious bone in your body. But I was rebellious. You did not want to tell me to do something I didn't want to do. And I was like that because my father had controlled me and manipulated me. And somewhere in that process, I made a pact with myself. <laughs> when I get out of here, nobody is ever going to tell me what to do again. Anybody been there, done that? Let's see a few hands. All right. That's a whole lot of folks. We got the right crowd today with the right message. Well, once you've made those promises to yourself and made those agreements with yourself, and then you begin to look into the mirror of God's Word and you say, oh, submission. Oh. Let other people have their way. Oh, yuck. Well, here's the thing. Even if you're willing to do it, you may not be able to do it. If you're addicted to that kind of behavior. So there's a lot of addictions besides just substance abuse addictions. And so I'm going to go through a lot of different things with you today. Hopefully there's going to be one or two that you're going to hit on and say, oh man, I have a problem with that. But the Bible teaches us that God will give us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that he will make us trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Our goal in life is not to get our own way, it's to glorify God. That's what we want to do. Let me tell you something, eternity is a really long time. I cannot even get a conception of it. Forever, how long is forever? It is forever. And the amount of time that we live here, even if you would live to be 100, is like one grain of sand on all the beaches in the world. So we need to really get busy serving God with our whole heart and wanting to live to glorify Him. 
Galatians 5, 22 and 23 teach us that we have the fruit of the Spirit on the inside of us. And one of those fruit is self-control. <laughs> it's not other control. It's self-control. And if you don't understand what that means, it means that God has given us an ability to control ourselves. So the first thing you have to do if you're going to break any addiction is stop saying, I can't control this. Come on now, don't look at me like that. <laughs> See, that becomes an excuse. Well, you know, I can't help it. This is just my problem. Just my bondage. I don't have any discipline. Yes, you do. I just can't control myself. Yes, you can. Maybe you haven't practiced it very much, but you could. The fruit of the Spirit is put in us in seed form. A seed of everything that God is comes into us the moment that we receive Christ. Think about that. A seed of everything that God is comes into us, into our spirit, the moment that we receive Christ. What does a seed need? Water. <laughs> What is the word called? The water of the word. <laughs> so the more we water that seed with the word of God, the more our mind is renewed, the more we begin to believe. And the Bible says, be it unto you even as you believe. Once you fully, completely believe something, the devil might as well get out of the way. Because there's going to be some changes in your life. Now, first thing we have to do is believe what we have before we're going to see it manifest in our life. You get it inside, then it comes to the outside. This is all inside out. That's why it's very important to stop saying, I don't have any self-control. I cannot control myself. How many of you say that? How many of you are going to stop it? All right. And when I ask you to admit to something, I don't want one of these things. If I said, how many want a free book, you'd be, ah. <laughs> so if I say, who has a problem with this? Now, let's just look at these scriptures, Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes is love, <laughs> joy, peace, patience, <laughs> and even temper, forbearance. That means that God's given us the ability to put up with stuff. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. Everybody say, I have self-control. Self Discipline is another word that we can use self-control. Discipline means to do what you know you should do when you don't feel like it and don't want to. Anytime that we're willing to do what's right and we depend on God, His grace is activated in our life and He enables us to do it. When I say that we have self-control, that still doesn't mean you can do it by yourself, but it means you have the ability to do your part if you're willing. You don't ever want to try to do anything without saying, God, help me. I cannot do this without you. God, help me. I cannot do this without you. You don't even want to know how many times a day I say that. How many times have I done what I'm doing this morning? Thousands and thousands and thousands. I started my day this morning with God, help me. I cannot go over there and do this without you. I need you. One of the reasons why we don't have victory in our life is because we hear somebody tell us, well, we should be this, that, or something else. And so we run home and try to do that and we leave God out of the loop. If there's anything that you hear me say today and you think, yes, I really need that in my life, then the first thing I want you to do is not go home and try. I want you to go home, study a little bit more yourself in this area and start praying, God, I know that this is a change that needs to take place in my life, but I cannot do it without you. God is honored when we lean on him. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Discipline is what we have to make us do the things we should do in order to have the things that we want. <laughs> the distance between where we are and where we want to be 
is always filled with doing what we don't want to do. How many of you want to be out of debt? Well, then you got to stop spending money <laughs> that you can't spend. You got to stop buying things you don't need. Well, yeah. well sister, I'm praying for a miracle. <laughs> God's given you one. It's called self control. <laughs> If I want the freedom that Jesus promised me, then I need to set aside some time for him to study the word and get with him. Self-control automatically means that we are not to be controlled by other people. <laughs> now, people that are brokenhearted and wounded usually do one of two things. They either let everybody else control them because they have a lot of fear in their life, or they want to be the one in control and they become very obnoxious and nobody ends up liking them. We are to choose to be led by the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen to what I'm going to say. This automatically means if I'm going to be led by the Holy Spirit, that not all people will always approve of all of my choices. If you're going to be led by the Holy Spirit and think that everybody's going to applaud for you and clap for you, you are wrong, wrong, wrong. Because the devil will use people to try to derail you from following the leadership of God in your life. Everybody wants us to do everything they're doing, but God is sometimes downright outrageous, and he will lead you to do the exact opposite thing from what everybody else is doing. He'll lead you to do things that have never been done before and things that nobody is going to understand. Amen? It's part of our healing, making that decision, I'm going to be led by you, God. You see, the Holy Spirit is a counselor. And he will counsel you right out of your problems all the way into freedom. If you will follow him. But you have to remember that when you follow God, the devil is going to provide somebody that's not going to like it. And it's usually going to be somebody that you care about and you really want them to think well of you. Now, come on. I want you to listen to me today. I'm trying to help you. When I was called to preach, which was a major part of my healing because I am a very, very responsible person. So when God gave me the responsibility of teaching the word, there's no way that I would do it and not give it my 100% best. So I study my head off. But the thing was, was that studying, being in the word all the time, was what brought healing to me. So I would use the word to bring healing and freedom in my life and then basically just put it out on a plate and let everybody else eat the same thing I was eating. I'm very convinced when I share with you that what I'm saying works. I'm not guessing. I'm not hoping so. I didn't get this out of a sermon book. I've tried it. And I'm here to tell you that I'm teaching you truth, and it's truth that will set you free. It's the Word of God applied in your life. We all need good, sound, solid doctrine, but we need more than that. We need life application. And so I studied very hard, and that studying was part of my own healing. But when God called me to teach, and I stepped out and started teaching just a little home Bible study, it's amazing how many people got mad. Here I was, just as innocent as I could be. I was just trying to do what I felt like God wanted me to do, and everybody got mad. I lost my friends. I got kicked out of my church, <laughs> ostracized by family, and I was shocked. So I'm just letting you know, don't be shocked. <laughs> if you try to do what you think is right and everybody doesn't clap and applaud for you. And at that juncture is where many people turn back from what they believe really in their heart to be the will of God and they go with people. And they listen to me, they stay miserable. You have to understand that I would not be standing here healed today if I would have said, well, I don't want to get kicked out of my church. Okay, I'll do what you're saying. Or if I would have said, well, gosh, I, I don't want to lose my friends. I don't want to not be invited to parties and have everybody talking about me. Okay, I'll just do what you want me to. <laughs> Come on.
Now, I'm not talking about having some kind of rebellious attitude where you never listen to anybody. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about not letting people control you. Well, there's only one way to truly recover from addictive behavior, and that is to know who we are in Christ and to believe that we have worth and value because Jesus died for us. Together, we are providing desperately needed medical care. We're feeding hungry children. We're giving homes to orphans. And you and I, with God's help, are doing more than we could ever do on our own. We are Joyce Meyer Ministries Hand of Hope, and we appreciate you for being a part of it. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl/partner.